Okay, so uh, <coughs> last but not least in a Android class, I should show you how to publish your Android programs, right? I don't know, maybe not. No. No? Okay. So we know how to get the APK file, I hope. The APK file comes out of the Eclipse. In fact, I'm going to take a look at this sample project here. I'm going to actually look at this one. I've got four or five different sample projects for you to, uh, to, to look at today that's on, excuse me, I can't talk over people, I'm sorry. Not today. <laughs> sorry. Um, so well, let's see, I've got a couple of different examples I'm going to show you today, so I'm just going to pick one of them at random here to show you what I'm talking about. In the bin directory, we have an APK file. We know that we can drag and drop this, I hope, at this point, and put it on an Android device. We do that by plugging in the Android device, mounting it like a USB drive. What gets mounted is the SD card on the Android device. So if it's a tablet, if it's a phone, it all works the same way. As soon as, and usually you get the cable with the device, but they also make generic cables. Can we please keep it down? Or I'm going to take the attendance away, and we're going to have to have Joel come in here. Thank you. Um, long story short, you should have one of these cables. You hook the cable up to your device. You hook it up to the USB port of your computer. You mount the SD card. You drag and drop right from here, and you can stick it on your device. And you can run it from your device by clicking on from the SD card, a file manager or something, going to the SD card location, or maybe you know, if you downloaded it from the internet, it works the same way. Pressing on it, running through the install, that happens automatically. That's all fine and dandy if you're using it on your device. However, if you're going to use it on somebody else's device, if you're going to try and distribute it, you actually have to put a, put a footprint on it. You have to certify it and certify that it came from your computer and that it, it, it's basically your product and it wasn't altered. A few other things that you also need to do is remove the log messages and all of the debug information because the package when it's actually distributed doesn't contain any debug, doesn't contain any log features, has a certificate associated with it that it came from your computer. It's very similar to getting the app key for the maps actually. You're running something on your computer that's going to generate a key, you're going to apply the key. Eclipse does it for you automatically so you can actually export it out. So what I'm going to do, rather than running through the whole thing, which is going to take way too much time, and they keep changing, they also keep changing the process a little bit, but it hasn't changed recently past, because now we have Google Play, and so it's a little bit different. So if you write down this URL here, developer.android.com, in a subdirectory called distribute, these are instructions for you to follow to distribute your app in Google Play. It has to meet certain requirements in order to uh, be uploadable. There's no fee outside of a maybe, I think it's like 15 bucks or something, 10 bucks, 15 dollars, to sign up for the Google Play account. Outside of that, there's no associated yearly annual membership or anything like there is with the Apple Store. So I've kind of kept this up here. You can write that down. Or you could uh, replay the video and kind of get it from there as well. If you go and look at this, what this will do is run through the steps. You don't have to put it in Google Play. There's a ton of app people that put this on a website. And the user goes to the website with their phone and they press on it and it installs it on their computer. That's actually the same thing that you can do that I just showed you a few minutes ago. And, but instead of taking the USB cable and dragging and dropping and putting it on the device, you load it on a URL and you put the URL in a link on an HTML page and the person clicks on it <laughs> and it downloads it to their computer. It downloads it to their SD card and you install it from the SD card. Same process actually. And there's a lot of people that do that because they don't want to pay the 15 bucks or maybe they don't want to publicize the app, um, you know, maybe for testing or something. So it goes through and looks at, and I'm just going to briefly give you the policies and give you kind of an overview of this. There's a lot of reading that's associated with it that you want to follow through because there's a, all this, everything is, keeps getting updated and changes and stuff. There's no requirements except for they do monitor. There's general practices and publishing standards. You can't put something pornographic out there, something copy protected. Actually, you can 
put pornographic stuff. It, it, there's limitations in terms of the images that you're going to post up there, and I'll show you about the images in a few minutes. The content, it's not monitored like the Apple Store, but it's, for the most part, censored. There's policies and best practices. Uh, determining your app's content rating, you know, is it everybody, low, maturity, high, you know, you probably have to make sure you put it in the right rating, essentially, if you're going to upload something. Otherwise, if you put it in the everyone category, it's going to be rejected. It does get reviewed. You upload it, it gets reviewed, it becomes live, and I'll show you that interface in a few minutes. Determining the country, confirming the app's overall size, making sure that it's under, so published uh, the maximum size is 50 megabytes so you can't have anything above that usually uh, most apps are like three or four or five six and 20 25 maybe a half of that you know unless you got a lot of graphics or something which means you can't take a bunch of video and put it in the app <laughs> because that's going to make it more than 50 megabytes uh, it has to have an APK extension on the file um, there has to be a, there's only one APK file per app and the app itself gets registered with a version and we have API different API levels and this is where the manifest actually we have a minimum SDK version and we have an API level so what ends up happening is you're going to upload this APK file and you're going to upload it into Google Play and Google Play is going to look at it and go what is this thing what well, it reads the manifest and in the manifest and we look at the manifest for this particular program here and hopefully I have it specified you can specify the range. Uh, let's take a look at the XML. There we go. And this one does not have it. Okay, great. It has the package information, but in here, this is not able to be distributed because I don't. I have not specified in my API. Excuse me, in my APK file because the manifest doesn't contain it. Maybe one of these has it. Let's see. Uh, let's try the notification real quick here. These are sloppy examples. They don't contain everything. Ah, this one has it. Android version code, version name. Let me zoom in so you can see this. So this is code version 1, which means this is version name 1.0. Nobody ever calls their app 1.0. But if I were to upload this app and it were to read the manifest file, it would call it 1.0 <laughs> in Google Play. These are the settings that you're going to put in Google Play, believe it or not. So you have a minimum SDK, maximum SDK. You have, and these are all tags that you're going to put in, just like this. You know, Android dot minimum, you know, Android colon minimum SDK. Version number, code, uh, name. Here we go. Here's the minimum Android version down here on the bottom. That means if someone on a 2.0 phone tries to download this, it's going to say, I'm sorry, not compatible. But anything above 3, or 3 or above, it's going to be, okay, it will work. So the settings from the manifest automatically get generated from the uploaded APK file that you're going to put in there. And all of a sudden, these fields are populated in this template that gets created from a website. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. So when someone goes to the App Store and they look for your app, here's the settings, essentially, which is how the relationship is working. Um, even your application icon, everything is housed in with the uh, in with the app, as we know already. So if we go back out here, we'll see um, we have to decide whether the app is going to be uh, free or priced. This is the new part, actually. They recently changed the pricing, so you can. I don't. I'm not actually. This just happened within a couple weeks, actually. So the billing is different now. <laughs> billing pricing. Google Play manages all of that stuff for you, actually. Um, so. You can set the price of the products. Okay, so you can state, we can start localization as well. State the localization so you have a default localization that occurs. These are all settings, and I'll look at that in a few minutes that you can set for the particular app. Prepare promotional graphics. Um, you'll have a couple of screenshots that you'll have to put together of your app if you want that you know can show you pictures of what the app looks like and stuff like that. So building and uploading the release ready app. There's instructions, believe it or not, to be followed for Eclipse, where it's all GUI. You just select the menu items for it. So you complete the app's product here. <coughs> so down on the bottom, the final checks before publishing, and it's pretty long. Support users after the launch, yada yada. If you go into the um, requirements for publishing updates, 
Google Play badges, links for your products. Uh, they've changed this website over the last weekend or so. Here we go. Preparing for release is what you really want to actually kind of look at. And then the preparing for release, it basically gives you the publishing instructions. And in here they used to have it. I'm pretty sure they still have it. Uh, configuring your release. Turning lo logging off, turning debugging off, all of the different instructions. It's going to take you about an hour to an hour and a half to prepare this thing for release. <laughs> Because you're going to have to go in and you're going to make sure this is set, is that set. And there's a big old checklist. You know, is this, is this going to be set right? You know, um, And then you have to clean up the directories a little bit. Take all the excess files out of there. Make it as small as you want. Uh, you, want you don't want it to, you know, make sure your permission elements are in there. You're setting the correct permissions. Um, building the app for release. And then here you go. You compile and sign with Eclipse. So if you click on that, you can... Uh, basically go file export and here's what ends up happening in fact I'll, I can show you it's not going to be uh, I'll take this notifications this notifications sample app here that I know has the minimum release on it I'm going to go on file and I'm going to click export and then in the export directory uh, run debug hold on one second hold on one second Export Android application, which will actually take out all of the debugging, take out all of the different um, logging, all of the different information, and et cetera, that's uh, needed and required. Let me go back over here. So you open Android folder, you go to the Export Android application, you click on Next, you follow through the... Uh, I don't have a key here actually, so I don't know if this is going to work, but let's see. Next. The project name, I'm going to call it notification. Next. So the debug key store utility that you use to create the map key, you do the same process all over again, but you go to a different website and you get a distribution key. And you cut and paste and you put it in here or you set the location to the key store. I believe I actually have a key store. You only do it once. Uh, don't know if it's on this computer, however. Let me just make sure. Don't know where I stored it, actually, and I don't really want to sign this thing. But you could put a... Essentially, you follow the instructions that have changed slightly, actually, recently have changed. Securing your private key, you don't actually, you're running store pass, key pass, it's the same process for the map key. So if you've gone through the map key exercise, you know how to generate the key for your app as well. You just go to a different website, actually. Um, in fact, you don't even have to go to the different website. You can actually use the key that comes out of the debug. You don't actually have to, you don't have to actually have to get a certificate. You don't have to have anything authority-wise for this at all. But you do have to actually generate the key. So once you get the key, you basically save it in a file, and you use the key for all of your apps. It's the same way as you use the map key for all of the map apps. Um, so basically, uh, we have a key store that's basically going to be run to secure the app. And it basically just identifies the app as coming from your computer. Once you've supplied that information in here, and you click on next. Actually, let's just see if this works. No, key store does not exist. Yeah, I know. Uh, here, create a new key store. There we go. Enter key store password. Passwords don't match. Hold on. I'm faking a key store. <laughs> next. <laughs> you can put in uh, first name, last name, organization, all of the information associated with who, who created this. Uh, you can leave some of it blank. Uh, let's see, key alias, my key. My key password test. Let's go. Yeah, I know. Password doesn't match what I gave it on the other. Uh, anyway, doesn't get. Let's see. Maybe I can do it. You can generate it for every application. Nope. You generate one time. It comes from your computer. It's the same type of. Um, it's the key store, the debug file, same file that you use for map applications for the API. 
you run the same process on it, you get the same code and you put the code in here. Or you can actually take the code and get a certificate and link to the certificate. You don't actually have to get certified. You don't have to have a certificate for it. And you can actually, if I were patient enough to type in the correct passwords that I used on the last screen, I can actually fake it and run through it here by putting a name and a password in there as my authentication. It's basically fingerprinting it or footprinting it with what computer it came from, and it keeps some information about the, the computer itself. You can use the same key with everything you distribute, <laughs> just like you use the same key on the same computer, yeah. If you built it on this computer using Eclipse, you can use that same key. If you use a different computer, you have to generate a different key store. You have to use, it, you have to use the same utility, but all over again to create a different computer. Because it's basically authenticating that came from this computer. Yeah. And you have to upload it from this computer. <laughs> oh. So do it on the same, develop on the same computer that you're going to generate that key store on. Or you're going to use the key store tool to generate the certificate if you're going to do it that way. Or you're just going to upload the key store. And if you go through here, I'm going through this very quickly, but if you go to the website, it runs through the entire process for you step by step. And then upload it into Google Play. I'll show you that in a few minutes using the same computer. Everything matches, then it's authenticated, no problem. When you start moving stuff around and start uploading it from different locations and then you use a different key from a different computer, then you're going to get rejected. <laughs> so whatever your development system is that you're using, Eventually, when you export, because you're exporting it out of Eclipse, actually. Um, let me just, uh, it's not going to like this password. Uh, uh, Ten years. You're giving it a number of years. The most years field is empty. It's not empty. Uh, at least one certificate field. Uh, let's go back. There we go. Next. <laughs> A destination API file, uh, I'm just going to call it, I'll just put it on the desktop. Uh, there we go. Uh, notification, uh, we'll put it on the desktop here. There we go. Uh, okay, that's good. Finish. I put in fake information, by the way. You can act, that actually works. I don't recommend it. I recommend actually generating the key. Because otherwise, it's going to come back with unknown authentication method. And then you have the slight chance of it being rejected. Uh, but what I just did is I exported out, and you see it right here, the APK file. The next step would be to upload this file into Google Play. So I have Google Play opened up in uh, my Firefox, so I'll go into um, Safari and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if you do, uh, actually, let's go here, Google Play. I don't have the, uh, I don't have the link actually saved in here. So uh, Google Play. If you're not uh, logged in, and I hope I'm not logged in over here, I'm not logged in over here, um, you sign up for a Google Play account that is linked to your <coughs> Gmail account, just like YouTube. If you've ever experimented with YouTube, uh, with Google+, Plus, with Google Talk, all the same process, all the same steps all over again, but you have to sign up for Google Play. The last step of Google Play is going to require you to put in a credit card number or that's going to have a $15 charge, I think, on it, you know, because they charge you like 15 bucks. One time shot when you sign up for the account. So when you keep the account, don't close the account, and you'll never have to pay $15 again. That's the policy right now. I have no idea what it's going to be five years from now, one year from now. But um, if you sign up for a Google Play account, and I have my account opened over here, I had it open, let's see. You get a nice little interface, and here's an interface right here for my Google Play account that I have for ITU, actually. And in here I have an ITU mobile app, and I put 1.1 as the version <laughs> in my manifest file for that app. And I'm going to run through, and I'm just going to click this little button over here. I'm going to pretend like this app's not here, and just show you what the interface looks like, with hopefully not messing anything up. I don't want to mess up this app, so I'm going to leave it alone. So instead, I'm going to say, this is my first app. I can put as many apps as I want in here. They're all going to come from this account, however. So I'm going to click on Upload Application. If you have a brand new account, yours is going to say nothing on it. And you're just going to have Upload Application. You're going to have that button I just pressed. If I open up that button, here we go. We have a Select the App. This is that notification app that I just created. And I'm going to go like this with it. 
And I'm going to upload it because I don't have to, I can upload it without publishing it. <laughs> oh, it's going to say it requires that a certificate be used to sign in. See, I created it with a bad, I, it's better to get the certificate. So I didn't take the time to cut and paste it, and I don't know if it's on this computer or not because I actually used a different computer to actually upload that other app. So the certificate is not on this computer. Um, so Google Play requires a certificate be used to sign the app to be valid until at least October 2033. Create a new certificate. Actually, this would have worked, but I put in the wrong date. I put 20, 10 years instead of 25 years. So, in fact, there was a prompt that told me that as well. So I have to recreate the, yeah, I have to recreate the app in order for this to work. But when you put it in, um, instead I'll just show you this one here. Actually, whoa, look at that. Maybe that was a warning. Who knows? <laughs> what you get is an interface that looks like this. That said, uh, here are the app files. There's no app files in here because that one didn't work. But on the product details, you're filling in all of the information that's going to show up in Google Play. And what is this going to be? There's going to be screenshots that you're going to upload. And the screenshots, you know, have to be of certain dimensions here. And you can you basically create the screenshots. And this is very picky. You have to follow the correct diameters of each one of the pictures. Uh, make sure it's of the right resolution. Upload the files into the system. Set the resolution for the icon. Set the icon. Set the marketing information. The listing details. You write a description of it. You uh, have your publishing options. Uh, whether or not you're going to have it uh, on the high uh, maturity, medium maturity, low maturity, everybody kind of thing. Let me show you the app that's already set up so you can sort of see what that looks like. And I'm just going to click on it here to open it up. So this app is a finished uploaded app where I've got screenshots. At least two are required that you put in there. So some people actually who can't create screenshots will actually just write stuff in paint, you know. <laughs> so, you know there's some really bad screenshots up there. The logo that's going to be used for the app. So this is going to be my high resolution logo. You can also put in a low resolution logo. There's different options. It's basically uploading and filling out the template, sort of like a form, and figuring out which information you need. Uh, this one's got a little description that's about it, stuff like that. Um, recent changes. Uh, the current version information is in here as well. Um, I think I've got it on everybody. These are all the countries that's available in. Um, and then, uh, you know, some contact information at the bottom here. Um, I don't have, uh, this is new actually, Google Cloud Messaging Stats. Interesting. Um, the application meets, uh, you know, I'm consent consenting that it meets um, the Android content guidelines, blah, blah, blah. When you actually select um, and save it, don't want to save any changes here, so I'm going to, I'm going to press the back button instead. So I don't want to, this is a live app, actually. You'll see uh, error listings, no reports yet, which is good. Um, you'll see information associated, comments that people make on your apps, all through the Google Play panel that you're looking at right now. The panel is like the major interface to the Google Play. It's kind of like using YouTube. You have to actually just kind of familiarize yourself with all of the features and all of the options. All your apps are going to be housed at the same location, which is going to be right here. As an example, let's say, for example, I make an increase, uh, an upgrade to this mobile app, 1.1. It's this particular API was identified as 1.1. If I automatically upload another one and call it 2.0, and what I do is basically upload it, put it in, all the people who have downloaded it will automatically get an update notification because the system through their Google Play that's installed will actually just notify everybody, hey, there's a new app open. Remember those annoying notifications you get that are sent to you? That happens automatically through Google Play. So the system will automatically send my users. And I go, well, who are my users? Well, I can look at my stats and see who my users are, actually, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so the stats on this app, not too many people are using it, actually. Um, I can see what kind of phones are on, like 2.33 plus, 4.0. There's a couple of 2.2 users on here, two of them. 
Most of them are on, uh, but not too many are on 4.0, actually. I can sort of see which kind of devices, which platforms are being used, the activity level. And you can actually tell when people are using your app versus just downloading it and never using it kind of thing. So a bunch of stats actually get kept on this, um, believe it or not, which is kind of scary if you think about it. Google's keeping track of everything you're doing. <laughs> so... Um, I can also get people who can give comments and stars and ratings and stuff. There's only three people who have rated this so far. And one person who says, really amazing, I like it. Well, that's probably, yeah, yeah I know that person actually. So, <laughs> Long story short, you can see if there's a bug in your program, people, and this is people when they're in your app itself, excuse me, when they're in the settings for your app, and when you're looking at your app, they're answering and they're basically rating from the Android phone automatically. So as a developer, you don't have to worry about any of this functionality. It's the same functionality you get for all apps. If you've ever installed an app before, if you've ever rated an app, same thing's available for your app. Um, the only thing you have to do is uh, upload it into Google Play, hit Publish, which is one of those options, then it's available. So what ends up happening is it'll sit, once you've uploaded it, it'll sit like this for maybe a day, and the turnaround time is about five or six hours-ish. It doesn't post immediately because it does get checked. It wants to make sure you're not putting copyrighted material in there. It's the same thing that happens with uh, YouTube, actually. But YouTube posts immediately. So if you put a video on there, then later on you get, hey, this, this contains copyrighted information. You know, I don't know if anyone's ever familiar with that, but it's the same interface. Well, it's Google. But before they actually publish it, make it available in the App Store or in the Google Play Store, it, there's a transition time of about five or six hours for it to get approved, and then there's another three or four hours for it to actually show up and be live. And then you go to any Google Play on any phone, and it's there. And you can search on it, and it's permanently in there, actually, until you take it out. You can remove it from this screen as well. Um, so, and you can update it from the screen only, and then these, basically there's a new option now, and this is brand new actually. It says it's published, you can see here. I can temporarily unpublish it if I want, take it out. I can update it by putting in, uploading a new one that's of a higher version, and then it'll automatically go to that. I can advertise it, I can do everything, everything's controlled through the Google Play interface, and uh, it's play.google.com actually is the URL for that. Uh, actually, let me just do this. I don't know, because I'm logged in. I don't know if it's going to do it. Actually, I can go back to Safari, perhaps. Here it is. The URL you want to get to this to create your account to log in is play.google.com forward slash store. You do need a Gmail account for it, because they link it to your Gmail account. Um, doesn't have to be the same Gmail account that you actually use, though. But It's nice, though, because you'll receive messages activity that's going on on your app and stuff like that. All the interfaces through that Gmail account. So. so, use the key store, generate your certificate, put it in there. Actually, I think that would probably work if I change the years, but uh, we'll just leave it at that. So. so that was one of the things I wanted to show you. Another thing I wanted to show you is about three different apps. Um, and the three different apps are all available, and I put them in a file, let me just go find it here, on the bhacker.com website, it is in supplemental notes, um, here they are, there's a database, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five examples I have left to show you that I haven't shown you yet, that I should have shown you by now, content provider number one and two, uh, database notification and camera act uh, camera example. The camera example isn't going to work on my emulators. <laughs> it will work on your real phone if you get a real phone and copy it on there. So this is where you can find the examples. And um, what I want to do is, oops, no, oh, no. Uh oh, frozen. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back to life, back to life. All right, cool. I thought it was frozen. <laughs> Probably was momentarily. 
Since I have opened up the uh, notifications app first, I'm going to go ahead and start with that one. The purpose of these examples is to show you some of the concepts I gave you PowerPoints on, but I never actually gave you the source code for. To show you how easy it is to implement some of these concepts. And uh, what you know so far is pretty much the basics in terms of, and what you should know by, by now is the basics in terms of how to build the app, how to create activities. Every one of these examples is extending from activities, same as before, but they're all accessing different features of the phone. In this particular case, we're making an instance of the notification manager, just like the location manager, just like the provider manager, <laughs> just like all of the other things uh, that we have managers for um, in terms of the label. And uh, the notification manager manages the notifications section of the phone. And that's the top bar, and we'll see it on the emulator in a few minutes. If you don't have a Google phone, you don't know what it looks like. But you know when you put your finger on the top and you drag it down and you see those notifications? You can create an app that generates your own notifications. And you can put anything you want in those notifications. This particular example puts a, a URL in there so you can click on a link and go to a website from the notification. So it's just you can put... <laughs> buttons in there, website URLs in there, pictures in there, icons in there. And this one is actually putting an icon in there as well. Um, so on the on create, after we've created our instance, we're using a private notification manager, M for my notification manager. We're creating an instance of the object notification manager. And we're going to get the system services, the notification service. We've seen the get system services before in a different example. Um, where we were looking at, um, I believe, uh, battery life or something. I'm not quite sure what that example was doing. But it's the same concept as before. The notification service is provided by the phone. It's a background process that runs. So we just basically get it, make a reference to it, call it M Notification Manager, and then we get the notification details. And so in here, we can say from uh, our resource file, we can have a new alert, click me, uh, that we're going to add. And so if we go r.drawable, uh, let's go back into here. Actually, the resource, let me just show you the resource file for this real quick. There's nothing to it, actually. It is uh, as plain as you can get. It has two boxes on it. One that says uh, send and the other one uh, says notify and cancel. Let me zoom in so you can see. Two buttons. One to send the notification on to cancel the notification, remove it from the notification bar. And uh, in the code, go back to the code real quick here. Oops, let's see. The entire program is running from this little bit of source code right here. This is the entire class that's being used for it. And uh, we've got the two buttons that we're getting from the resource. We're getting the, uh, the information the new alert, click me, which is going to be the information that's going to show up in the notification. And this is part of the new, this is created by a new notification. So this is notification, notif notified details, which is a new notification. So this is the actual notification that we're going to use. And uh, in the actual notification, it's just nothing more than a you know new alert, click me, and uh, that's about it. It's going to show up in there. In the, uh, and we're making two references to a start and a cancel button that's coming from the R resource. This stuff you should probably be familiar with. In fact, most of the stuff you're probably familiar with already. Here we got, we have our on click listener that we're going to do. We're going to have an on click method down here. Set on click listener with on click. And uh, the notification manager is going to cancel on the cancel button. And then on the new or send button, it's going to send the notification. And so here's the on click up here where we've got a character sequence is going to be a content title for the notification, notification details, then the text for the notification, browse Android's official site, uh, an intent that's being created. It's called a notify intent that's actually going to be used from the notifications window. So it's a different form of the same intent model. So it's an intent. We're calling it notify intent because we're going to basically bring up a different screen. We're going to bring up our web browser. So when you click on the link in the notification, the intent is going to spawn off the web browser and open up this link, this URL. And the link that's going to be opening up is android.com. Probably 
may or may not work actually because I think it's supposed to be developer.android.com, but we'll see. So hopefully you're familiar with the intent concept. If you're not familiar with that, I would be because that's something that's going to be on the final, actually. <laughs> On-click listeners are on the final, actually. So we're intents. How do we use the intent to switch from one application to another? We're using one here for the notification. We're going to create a pending intent because it's not going to happen immediately. We actually have to queue it up because the notifications are a service. And the notifications come in. They stay there for a few. They get uh, ran through the sequence. Can we keep it down? It's a little bit too loud. Thank you. Um, and then they actually get serviced. So we have a pending intent intent, which is going to be the activity of the simple notification, which this is simple notification. And then uh, we are going to notify. We're going to send the notification. So when this application actually runs, and when we send the notification, we're packaging up the notification details in this object that we're calling the notification. In the object, we've got the context, the title, the text, and the intent. Because we need to send it all. Because when the user clicks on it, they're going to invoke the intent. They're going to see the title. They're going to see the text. And let me show you what this looks like so you can actually visualize what's going on here. If I were to run this application, Oh, you can control everything in terms of the notification. Yeah, you create a notification object, and you can set the title, the tags, everything. Huh? More fun that way? Yeah. Well, actually, that's what this is really doing. This is a showing a status bar, actually. But so if I send, if I click on here and send, that's what the example is actually doing. Let me take off this integrate. I'll keep disabled again. All right, there we go. So if I press on send notification, here's my notification. My notification says, um, what, what it said, something, the title was new alert, click me or something. And in here, if I click on the intent, it, oh, excuse me, click on the item, because I have an on click on the notification, takes me to android.com, which is actually, actually, 40, 40, 400 million devices are activated. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, android.com, actually. Uh, which, yes, it brought up the mobile website. So. It didn't bring up the developer, so I could change the URL. Uh, but to show you the different pieces one more time to kind of get you the, the details in terms of the title, this is where the notification came through. And it originally says up there, new click, new alert, click me, which is going to be actually here. Let's go back. Cancel intent. It only shows up for a few minutes, actually. And then it goes away. So it says new alert, click me. It will go away. There it goes. It goes away. So that's that information that we're setting in terms of the notify. So that's the notification that we're receiving. And then we have the body of the context of the, of the notification that's showing up with the notification details for the, we have the title, and then we have the text, the content text. And the text is the browse Android. This is the, the stuff that's written up here. It says browse Android official site by clicking me. So if I open up the intent, I get the browse, oops, if I can hold it down there long enough, browse Android official site by clicking me, which is the information that's showing up on the text, the content text. And um, we're creating some strings, taking the strings and adding them to the notification object, passing them to the notification object. So we have one string, and, and this is, character sequence is equivalent to a string, by the way. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, and then on the intent, it's nothing more than parsing out this uh, URL and going to the URL when you actually click on it, and which is going to be the on-click here. On um, the on-click, this is in the on-click method, by the way, for the send. And then for the cancel, we're basically taking notification manager dot cancel simple location ID. This is the process that's the called simple notification in terms of its application name or process name. So if we click on actually clear should clear, right? Yeah, clear cleared it. 
Hansel should clear it too. <laughs> so anyway, it's a simple kind of way. And the thing is, is you're gonna eventually try and hopefully create it. Well, you don't actually have to try and do this at all. Not not part of any of the assignments for this course. But eventually, you're probably gonna run into a situation where you want to notify the user of something. Hey, you got a new text message. You got a new something or other. You're basically going to follow the same identical pattern over and over and over again. And you're just going to change the parameters of the title, change the parameters of the text, and then voila, you've got a new intent. So basically, you don't actually have to run the intent either. These lines are optional because I put that so when you click, it's going to change to the, um, to the web browser. The intent's actually just running the web browser. Um, loading up this web page right here. It's running a URI parser. It's running a URI object instance, which is nothing more than going to a URL uh, for android.com or whatever. You don't have that in there, you can take this out and just put up the message. When the user clicks on the message, they just read the message, that's it. You can actually stick buttons in the message, you could stick images in the message, you can put anything you want in the message. Um, there are, well actually I shouldn't say, there are some limitations, you can't put audio in the message, uh, but as the, and actually as the APIs keep evolving, Certain things about the notification parameters and like have, have evolved as well. So, um, but you're using the notification manager and you are essentially uh, accessing the service on the phone for notifications. So, okay, that was the notification one. I want to show you the content provider examples, and these are actually easier. There's two content providers examples. One is called content user demo. And I believe this is the easier one, so I'll start with this one first. It is. You're looking at the entire code for the entire program. And when you see it work, actually, in fact, we'll just watch it work here real quick so you can sort of visualize what's going on here. So the content provider demo is creating a new instance of the content resolver. And it's broken. No, it's not broken. It's just loading. Or it's broken one or the other. Well, let's just try it one more time. Oh, no, it's still trying to load. It was working earlier, so let's see. Let me try it one more time. It's probably on here already. Mm-hmm. Right before the class started, I ran both of these examples and they worked. So, uh, text to speech, options menu, uh, content, context, uh, context menu, I meant. Uh, oh, you know what? No. No, it's supposed to, hold on one second. Let me see if the other one runs real quick. I might have to reset the browser. I mean, I might have to reset the, uh, if one of these will run, it's enough, because it's both doing the same thing. Broken pipe. Um, I believe the communication between uh, Eclipse and my emulator has, has issues, so I'm going to stop this real quick and just start the emulator. <coughs> Actually, Let me start uh, this one here, actually. One moment. Technical failure with the emulator. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> you see those broken pipe messages? That's not a good sign. <laughs> Considering that's a network connection that's the issue, hopefully I still have network activity. You know, so It doesn't really need it, though. It's on local host. So. And it's doing port forwarding, so it should be okay. But we'll see. The content provider <laughs> is, uh, both of these two examples, is going to the service that is on the phone and is making a list of all of the different content that exists. One of the examples takes and reads and writes contacts to an address book. The other example just takes and lists, creates an entire list of all of the different content providers. The content providers are what's universal among all of the different applications that are running. So it's your contact list, it's your um, phone information, 
um, all a bunch of different things that are associated with data that's stored on the phone from applications that you're using, usually Google applications. Um, so it's like your address book, your email list, all that sort of stuff. Um, so when you write a content um, provider application, it's all the same. You're making an instance of the content provider. Let's just see if this works, actually. If not, I can try. There's one more emulator I can run. Oh, this one's working. OK. <laughs> so I just had to reset the emulator. Uh, let me just disable the mouse integration now. So this particular app is going to have one, two, three, four buttons on it. And the four buttons, I don't like this emulator because it's smaller text than the last one I was showing you. If I click on, and I'll show you the code for it in a few minutes, so I click on View Contacts here, it's not going to work. Uh, okay. I'm going to add a con I have nothing in this emulator, which is the problem. So um, I believe I have an icon here for contacts. I'm going to create a new contact for myself. Uh, let's see, download. Oops, that's what I wanted. Uh, hold on one second. Mm. Got a better idea. I mean, one more emulator that has contacts in it. <laughs> Let's go up to 4.0. There we go. This one's got an SD card and it has contacts loaded in it. If it doesn't, I'm going to give up. Actually, we'll just load a contact in. Emulator number three, third time's a charm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Make sure the emulator actually loads. Oh, it's loading. Generally, you don't need an SD card for content providers. They're usually stored on the phone because it's part of the Android operating system. It's stored in the memory of the phone. It's usually limited to a certain number of contacts, a certain number of information or entries. The emulators run a little bit differently, though. Most of the data for the emulators are stored on SD cards. So if you're finding that it's not working and things aren't saving correctly, just add a virtual SD card to your emulator and it will probably solve the problem. If this doesn't load, I'm just going to go through the code and not show it to you, but I guarantee it this will load. Okay. Let's see, went quick here. Oh, come on, unlock. <laughs> there we go. Unlock the sucker. There we go. People. People in here. Um, okay, let's, let's set the integration here too. I believe it's going to be in contacts, not people. Uh, hold on one second. I just want to check something out real quick. This one should work, actually. That's OK. Oh, that's not, that's not too pretty looking. Oh, here we go. OK, well, see, so nothing is stored on this one either. So, in this particular app, I've had it hard set, so if I press add contact, it will add as, as the toast message appears on the bottom. It says created a new contact. I'll show you the code for that in a second, in a few minutes. And if I select view contact, it comes in and shows me the contact. So I can modify the contact, and it says, you know, updated this, changed it to this. Delete the contact, remove it. If I remove the contact, when I go to view contact, it's not going to show anything. 
If you have an emulator that has an address book in it, or contacts, what this is doing is getting at the content provider contacts component. And it's keeping names, telephone numbers, addresses, and things of that nature. So you could add contacts to your phone or to your emulator, and they would actually work, and they would show up in a list. So let me uh, tell you what this is doing. And both of these examples are doing the same identical thing, actually. Um, on the on create, they're getting the content provider and the cursor. The cursor is very similar to the concept of the database um, cursor. It is the information that's stored in the temporary memory. So it's when you add a contact, when you delete a contact, it's all buffered in terms of what's being stored. So, and the cursor is like, you know, when you query a database, you get results that come back, and those results are in the form of a cursor, and you read and write to the cursor. This eliminates the need to actually read and write to the context list. Because if you open up the context list in your application, or if you're opening it up in your dialer or something, and if it doesn't use a cursor and it locks, only one person at a time can use the context. So it would limit the multi-threaded kind of processing um, concept that we get on the phone because we want to use contacts uh, on the dialer. At the same time, we might want to receive a message that uses the contacts for something. So the concept being the cursor is where you're storing the queried information that's coming in. Um, so the content resolver, CR, is going to be get content resolver. This particular method gets the content resolver. The content resolver contains all of the different content informations. They, one of them being the contacts that we're looking at. Cursor, cursor is equal to new content resolver dot query. What are we going to query for? Content URI, you know, system settings uh, in this particular case. And then let the activity manager manage the cur let the activity manage the cursor, which means we're going to work with the cursor information. The cursor is the result set that we got back when we queried the content provider to figure out what information the content provider actually is holding on to. Oops, this is the wrong example. Um, this particular example is not the one I just showed you, but I'm going to continue with it because I already started. This is basically going to query the content provider, come up with a list of stuff that's in there, and put it in a list box. Put it in a list for us and show us what's in the content provider. So we're going to start the content manager cursor, get the count so we know how many items there are, get the list view, create a list view, so the XML file for this has a list view on it, and it, we're going to make an instance of the reference, excuse me, we're going to make an instance reference object list view that's going to be compatible, or it's, going to, it's going to basically going to load the list view element from the main.xml file that we've loaded up here. And uh, we're going to take a string, and from the string we're going, to we're going to create into a string all of the different system settings that we have, and put them into a list box. So if I run this application, it looks like, and this should run because the other one ran as well. Mm -hmm. Hello. This was content user demo. I'm running the wrong one. Content user demo. Here we go. Because I just showed you content user demo was the application. Content user demo goes and queries the content provider and provides you a list. Here it is. It's working finally. I don't know why the font is so weird on this, <laughs> but uh, I'll just take it as is. Um, what we are looking at on the screen, uh, maybe I know what the problem is actually. There we go, that's the problem. So the content provider demo is the one that queries the content provider, creates a cursor of the information it has received back, accesses the cursor, takes each one of the items, converts it to a string, and puts it into a list box for us. So what we have now is a list of all of the different items that are contained. So in here I have volume music, ring five, ringtones, I have volume seven, there's seven, seven vo volume system items, whatever that happens to be. There's a several, there's four voice prompts, there's six alarms I have on this emulator. 
Um, volume, there's five different volume notifications, yada, yada. There's a lot of different content that exists in here. And um, stay on screen timeout, emergency tone. These are all the different settings that I can use and access in my Android apps. And so I can um, you know, access this. And some of it is database information, like contacts as an example. Some of it are just settings. So I know if I have Bluetooth turned on and off. I, I know if I have uh, auto time on or off. And what I do is I figure out which setting I'm looking for. Go to the content provider, get the information, which is going to be one of these items here. And then uh, run the method on it to manipulate the item, to turn off the setting, to change the setting, to you know, add something to the contact list, to take something away from, or you know, et cetera and so forth. So this example is nice because it's um, showing you the creation of the content resolver and the creation of the cursor, which is all this is actually, and then taking this and putting it into a list box. If you look at the resource um, layout for this. It is identical to the list box example that I gave you earlier in the course that you can also find in the same directory. This is the main file, and the main file is loading a list view. And list view has got a row in it. And the row is nothing more than a label, essentially, a text view that's showing you the content provider. And then next to it, it's also showing you, it's going to show you the number, uh, how many elements are actually in there. So you can get it item number one, item number two, or something. Uh, depending upon what the resource actually is. The thing with this is it's kind of a generic way of getting at the content provider, getting and looking at the cursor information, but you don't know what you're looking at until you actually kind of figure out, well, what one of these content providers, what am I going to look at? And so that's where example number two actually comes into play. And this is the one that's actually labeled content provider example, not demo. And this is the one that I showed you with the contact list with those four buttons on it. So if we look at this one, this one does the same thing as the demo, but instead of just showing you a generic list view of all of the items that are in there, it takes it a little step further. It looks at the content, um, contacts item, adds, deletes, and so it just works with one of them. Um, so the same process is used for every content provider. Um, so native content provider here, what we got are the buttons. Take a look here. Same kind of concept as before. We've enabled, instead of main, it's labeled XML files as a native content provider. Four buttons on there to create, uh, to view, add, modify, delete. On the on click listener, it's running the native content provider, complete displaying. Uh, display, con it's basically creating a log uh, contacts, uh, log detail for us so we can tell how far we got. So on the click here, on the create contact, is going to run a method create contact with a sample name and a sample um, email address, or actually it looks like telephone number is probably where this is going into. On the on click, uh, we're going to update, we're going to delete. So these are all the four different options for the four different buttons of the on click. Um, on click for the on click listener, the methods that we have to implement for the listener. and. In the, one of the methods, and I'm not going to go over actually all of them, I'll just take this one as an example, create contact. So we're doing the same thing. We're creating a content resolver, CR, cursor, cursor query, get the contact information. But here, instead of saying services, we're getting contacts. So we're basically taking the query from the cursor. Instead of getting system services, what we got on the previous example, showing us all the system services that are out there, this one's getting contacts specifically. And then we're getting the count of how many we have, and then we're going to display them out or do whatever it is we want to do with them, actually. Create a string, take the string, get the string from the cursor information, display the person's name, the person's cell phone number, and then here's where that toast message coming into play. The, the contact name such and such already exists, if it's already in there, because this is the create contact. And, uh, so it's going to look and see if that name actually exists. And otherwise, you can you know create something very similar to the last demo where it actually just goes out and um, adds a bunch of stuff um, to the contacts, put it in a list box, 
Um, when you click on one of the list box items, it can show you the details, perhaps, of each one of them. And there's, that's a very classic example, and I believe there's one on the Android developer.android website that does that, actually. Um, that is also available with the built-in apps. So there's one that shows you the content providers with, that's included with the sample demos for the APIs. Uh, that's worth looking at if you want to write something that works with the content providers. So. This is in lieu of working, looking at databases or text files or something of that nature. So, and the rest of the actually each one of these methods is doing the same thing. It's creating an instance of the content provider, creating an instance of the cursor, querying it, looking at the cursor information, getting the settings, getting the name, getting getting and setting essentially the different information. So, so the example uh, is actually you know kind of basic in terms of its functionality. The last example I wanted to show you today that I should have shown you a couple weeks ago actually was the one called Database Demo. This one's also available from the behacker.com website. It's just not a bad one to actually kind of look at as well. It demos the database features. The good thing about this one is if you've ever worked with a database before, it's the same concepts. SQL is SQL. You create a query, you run a query. You create a table, you delete a table. You truncate a table, you drop a table all the same commands that you might be interested with already. The difference between this one though is however is we have the main activity which is database demo and database demo. In fact a lot of people design database applications this way and, and what I'm talking about in terms of the design is that you've got the main app and then you've got the helper app or the helper class I should say I'm calling it an app I mean class. So database helper does everything associated with the database and so there's a demo that's also included in the Android samples that's a database demo. It's actually very similar to this one. That creates a database, and this one creates a database, and adds some stuff to the database and takes some stuff away from the database, essentially. So if I run the demo, hopefully it will work. If it doesn't, I'll go through it anyway. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Kind of a crude interface <laughs> where we have add employees. So I'll put an employee in here. I'll just call it Barbara. Uh, employee age, uh, 21. And uh, attach it to sales, add the employee. And then I can look at employees here. So I added an employee a few minutes ago. And I just gave it uh, text information here. In fact, I can add the same employee to IT as an example. Add employee. And we'll take a look at the code in a few minutes. If I click on the employees, I see now I have two employees in here. Well, it's the same employee I just put in a few minutes ago, actually, uh, which I put my name up here. And you can't see it because the screen, actually, I can't see it. I can scroll the screen. Hold on. There we go. Scroll it over a little bit. I can see uh, the information. I have one employee put in here, actually. And so if I can go back and I can add another employee and you can see it kind of just updates automatically and it's actually stored in a table that's accessible through the SQLite database that is available on the phone as a service that services up this particular app. The database does not work with other apps, only works with this app. And when I get rid of the app, the database table should go away as well, uh, which is interesting. Um, so the database helper class is generally created as sort of a design pattern for this type of application where it is responsible for creating the names of the tables and the table creation concepts and uh, here we have um, a bunch of strings created that represent the column age, column name, or the columns and the different components that we're going to use in the queries and then we have uh, the onCreate method and here's the part that you're going to find extremely easy and kind of like, oh, you know, nothing really to learn here. If you're familiar with databases already, you create a database object, DB in this for example, and we, we dot, dot execute query and we give it a query. <laughs> this is easier than JDBC actually if you've worked with that. Same concept actually, but di implemented differently and has nothing to do with JDBC, not to be, uh, not to confuse you. But this string is Actually, this is the hard way of doing it. You can put this query into a string, and you can just execute the string. You know, instead of writing all this stuff here, you could just say execute SQL. So we've executed SQL. We created this table, created that table. We created a trigger. We created a view. 
Okay. We insert the predefined departments that we've created in here. On an upgrade, and this is the interesting thing, is so databases, as I mentioned before, um, or I mentioned a few minutes ago, when you delete the app, you've deleted the database tables and everything associated with it um, in terms of the resources that are on the phone. What's on the SD card stays on the SD card. That doesn't actually get deleted, but the database does not reside on the SD card. It's part of the services that are available to the apps. When you update the phone, you are essentially updating the services. And what ends up happening is you can put a method in here, and this is on update. That happens automatically when the app is updated. This method will run when your app is started, when your app is life cycle starts. This is after it's been updated, update the tables. <laughs> So basically you're cleaning up, fixing any mess that may have occurred from the automatic garbage collection that occurs with that database from the services. So on a phone upgrade, on an app upgrade, on any type of an upgrade that occurs on the device, that data is going to be removed. So instead what you're going to do is you're going to drop the table if it exists, drop the table. If it <laughs> you're going to basically remove everything out that you want to clean up and then when your app starts up, if it doesn't exist, it's going to recreate it. So usually you set the app to, you know, look for the table. If the table's not there, create it and then populate it. And then on an update, drop it all, get rid of it all. And then the next time the app loads up, it's going to repopulate itself. Yeah, it gets rid of all your data. <laughs> but sometimes when the app is updated, how many people like, you know, change the database around a little bit, modify the tables? It saves you from having to actually manually go in and delete it because you can't. You can only access the database through the app. So long story short, the interface to this database and to these tables that you're creating, it's only accessible through the app. So if something happens, the app's got to take care of itself. So on an update, in this particular case, we're just dropping everything. You can have it drop it and recreate it if you wanted to. Um, but it's more classic to have the creation occur, and this is what's happening here, this is the onCreate method. And it's going to onCreate, it's going to send it the instance of the SQL database object. So the service is available to us, we don't actually have to create the database, we just create an instance of the database object, and then we start creating stuff. Create this table, create that table, do this, add this data to this table, and then you're looking at a database application. Everything that you've studied in database classes, essentially all over again. So in this particular case, so this is the database helper, which is functioning and working with all of the database information. You don't have to divide, design it this way. You can put it all into one class if you want to. But for abstract reasons, it's easier to kind of look at it this way. And um, here we can let, look at the values, put stuff in there, do all sorts of different uh, manipulations on there, get every, you know, from the cursor information. And then again, this is also the same thing as the content provider. We query the database, we stick it into a cursor, we work with the cursor. The cursor is just nothing more than the temporary memory that's storing the results of that database. This is instead of reading and writing directly to that provider um, or that database. Because anyone knows, you know, you don't want to actually pull something up that's a service and lock it. <laughs> The database as a concept, as a service, is used to create tables for multiple different apps. You bring it up, you lock it. If you're not using the, the cursor part of it, which you don't any, actually have any choice when it comes to databases, you actually have to use the cursor object. If you don't use that, you're locking the database essentially for any other app that might actually be using the database. Same way as you can lock the contact list, you can lock the SMS features or something, and then you provide you know, possibility of your phone actually irritating somebody because other apps aren't going to work while your app is running or something. Um, so, Alright, so this is just uh, nothing more than methods to get the department, update the employees, do a bunch of stuff on it. Um, everything in here is separated out. In fact, this is not a bad idea, and not a bad app to look at in terms of um, best practices. Um, so we have a, you know, a method, we have a class to add an employee, we have one specifically designed for alerts. This is all the same code that you've been looking at before. The database demo is doing nothing more than, uh, here it is here, it's just nothing more than creating an instance of the database object. And um, on the create, there's a little menu that gets created, and it's handling the UI, and the UI is associated with the XML file. Um, 
And the XML file is, is just uh, kind of trivial, actually. Let's take a look at it. We have an XML file interface to add the employee, the departments, add different departments. I didn't actually show you that part. Um, the list view, we have main. Main is essentially showing us the, the, the view of all of the, the list of all of the employees, the creation screens, the uh, add, the modify screens and stuff. So, Okay, that was the last of the examples that I had prepared for this section of the course. Um, I believe, let's see, we get to all of them. Never got around to the download file. You might want to experiment that with that one on your own. I'm afraid I'm practically afraid to show that one ever again because it requires that you have an SD card on your emulator, and my emulator just was not behaving two times that I tried to demo that. So I'm going to close VirtualBox down here just to make sure. I have one little mini lecture that I like to present to you, and then we're going to leave it at that. And, uh, it's the last lecture of the course, actually, and it is on test-driven development. And it's one of the assignments, which is why I have to actually, I have to actually show this to you. <laughs> it's testable material, but it's not. There's nothing very much. There's maybe one question on testing on JUnit, actually, on the uh, final exam. But you'll need this information to actually kind of as background preparation. But you probably have already done. I hope the testing assignment because it was like number two and it's also repeated in number three or four. So it's a simple little tutorial however. Uh, but here's the background information or the textbook information upon it. So test driven development which is TDD actually. I don't know if anyone really uses the acronym. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but Android SDK integrates JUnit 3 code style. Does not support JUnit 4 actually. Other Android projects might support it. Other APIs might support it. But Android just stops at three in terms of the code style. Many helper test cases, uh, test classes, uh, recommended best practices for putting tests in separate projects, but uh, shared folders. So you can share the folders, separate projects. Eclipse, they have a new Android project wizard, will do this for you. All you have to do is click the button that says create my JUnit tests. So most people are, you know, have, unless you've done the assignment and you've read through the JUnit stuff yet, you're probably not familiar with what I'm talking about. Unit testing takes, for each one of your classes, takes and creates another class called a test case class. <laughs> That's what JUnit does for you. Instead of actually having to manually create it, you can tell the project, do the style, and the different options have changed among most of the different updates on the API. So the screenshot may or may not necessarily represent the location of all of the different options to select. But long story short, you click some buttons and you automatically create test cases. The templates, just the outline, you actually have to fill in the, <laughs> the test. What are you testing? For each one of your classes, you have methods and you have data members. So you can test the values of the assignments of the data members. You can test the methods and the returns upon the methods. Did this get set? Did that get set? What happened? So same thing in other forms of development. JUnit does nothing more than exercise your classes without you actually running the program. So it will go through and make an instance of your object and it will test this method and will test that method. And we'll make sure that this got set, and that got set, and this value is not null. And you basically have to give it all the information, though. You have to tell it what you're supposed to be testing. So if you're working in the real world, sometimes you actually have to do this stuff because they want you to test. And this is part of unit testing. If you're developing applications for distribution, you got to test it, right? <laughs> so um, you can do this for Android and non-Android applications as well, any application. And you can do it inside and outside of Eclipse. You don't actually have to use Eclipse for this either. Um, if you do it outside of Eclipse, you actually have to create your own files. This will actually create the files for you automatically. And here we have, uh, this is test project name. We're creating another project, which is the test project in this particular case. I believe that um, we can integrate the two projects together as well. You can also integrate and put it in the same package if you want to as well. Um, so in this particular case, you're giving it a test example. Test is the example. Beware if both the source and the test packages are use the same libraries because you might have some conflicts or you might have some um, issues that might arise if they both match. 
You can also go online and look at the Android test case classes. That's on the developer.android.com website. In fact, it's part of the reading, I believe, for one of the assignments that also comes from the Android website. Um, it's kind of a little small little tutorial that will have you come through and create some test cases or something of that nature. Can't remember. It doesn't really do very much, actually. So the test case classes, the basic JUnit test, so you run the test with a cert method. The cert method actually just exercises. And when you need to, when you need an activity context, you can run the get context from the activity. So you can see that from the Android test case, from test cases versus Android test case, because we know we are working at the activity in terms of uh, the running inheritance. So when you want to use the mock context, you can have application test case. You basically are making setting different contexts for the use of the case depending upon the environment that you're running the particular in this particular case we're talking about an app but you can set the context differently for applications versus apps versus other things that you're creating so when you want to test just one activity you can create an activity unit test case allows you to uh, allows you to ask if the activity has started another activity or called finish or request a particular orientation or any number of different things that it might ask. So remember going back to the first couple weeks of the class when I talked about the activity life cycle. You can test the life cycle, see what happens on an on resume, see what happens on the, and this is particularly, this example is particularly asking about the activity on create. So as you go through the life cycle of the app, you can see what's going on. <laughs> was this done? Was that done? This is above and beyond putting log messages in the code. I've seen that actually the examples I showed you today, I didn't spend any time on it, but have writing log messages to the log. You hopefully know that. You can get that from the debugger that's in the SDK, excuse me, that's in the uh, Eclipse uh, menus. Uh, same way as we looked at the DDMS actually. So you want to do a functional test on an activity. You take it and uh, it allows you to send key events to the activity. Actually, you're just running the activity. You know, you're basically providing it a, you know, an on-click. You know, here you go. I clicked it or I touched it or whatever. And here I dragged it. I dropped it. Uh, basically, you're mimicking all of the activities that the user would do to see how the class is going to react. The interesting thing about JN is it's testable with inside of Eclipse. So you run the JUnit test, and it shows you the results, <laughs> the failures. You're not running it on an emulator. You're not running it anywhere else. It basically just kind of um, mimics everything. And same thing, actually, for non-Android applications. So you want to test the content provider. You, provide, uh, you can do a provider test case, STEM2. When you want to test the service, you can do a service test case. And as we've seen the content provider services today, you want to test the UI. Well, there's another application for that. There's the interface called Monkey. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, and I think I saved the link, actually, for it. So Android test case, you add the instrument to the application manifest file. So here we have the instrument here where we're going to run the package. This is the package in this particular example. The label is going to be test for my example. So we put the instrument for the test engine in the manifest because if we don't do that the project won't run it because the manifest controls everything. Hopefully you know this by now. Manifest controls everything about the application. <laughs> and when in doubt it's in the manifest. <laughs> So if you see a question on the mid, on the final that says, uh, the particular setting is in there, here, here, it's always the manifest. <laughs> if it's a setting related to the application, it's got to be the manifest, right? Security is in the manifest, the minimum version is in the manifest, everything. The title, the icon, everything's in the manifest. Um, okay, even the intents and the allowed classes that can run for the app. I'm not going to go through all of this code because this is actually outdated. Some of the stuff has changed and the tutorial that you have to run for one of the assignments will give you a more updated version of um, all of this stuff. But you can add, uh, this is when creating a second project, you can put another, um, you can add another package to it, another test example. Um, in here, this might or may or may not necessarily resemble the current API because this has changed with the plugins and the updates. And this is based on a, I think it's based on a 
But um, if you go in and run uh, JUnit test cases, I closed Eclipse so I can't do it, but uh, this is actually a pretty good example. This looks fairly up to date actually. Uh, so we go to create it, we would go new JUnit test case to create the test case. When we create it, uh, we're going to browse, we're going to put the test case uh, class under the test. We specify which class we're actually going to test in this particular test case. We have one test case per each class that we want to do because each class turns into one object essentially. We put in the name. This might not necessarily uh, be representative of the current current plugin actually. The menu options may have changed actually. And then we have here is an example here where we have class joke test which extends test case. So it's another class that's created that extends test case that gives us the methods and the functionality or the interface actually abstract interface to implement the asserts on each one of the methods that we have in the other class that we're testing. So we've created a class to test another class so we actually here over here is joke. This is a joke class from an old example actually. Joke joke equals new joke. So we make an instance of the class and then we run the methods on the class and we assert to see if we've actually gotten the correct response. And then we actually can test each one of the behaviors and each one of the methods to see if we've uh, is this equal to that? Did we set the data member correctly? Did the things flow as they were supposed to? When we run it, we do run as, and that's the second option. I know that's actually still the same because I see it all the time. It says Android unit test. And when you run the Android unit test, you don't get anything running. Instead, you've got this little screen that comes up, a little thing that says JUnit, another little window. You should see this when you do the assignment, actually. That's the purpose of the assignment is to actually check out these features. And you see green or you see red. What I don't like are uh, actually, I believe mine has uh, warnings on them now instead of errors as well. So the screen might have changed, actually. I think I'm missing the warnings on here. Either that or the warning. I always get warnings. So either that or the warnings don't show up, just the errors. Yeah. So how to do it, if you're going to implement JUnit 3, you can import the JUnit framework by doing a JUnit.framework on the imports, create a test case class here. This is a non-Android application, actually. This is just using right, plain old Java if you weren't using Eclipse. Uh, create the test case class, write the methods in the form of a test this method test, that method test, so you follow the standard and then you can assert this, assert that, essentially uh, come up with a logical um, logical relationship between the class that you're testing and the class that's running as the test case on the class. Compile, test the function, run a test runner to execute the tests. If you want to, you can automate the whole thing. Keep the bar green. You want to see green, you don't want to see red. You don't want to see yellow warning messages that come out of that. So, uh, Let's see, fixtures. Notice redundancies in the test methods. There's a lot of redundancy. Actually, there's the same amount of, this is why people don't like to run JUnit, because the same amount of programming that's required to write the class is practically required to write the test case to run the class. Actually, some people are going to say it's actually more work to write the test case <laughs> than it is to write the class, which is like why a lot of people don't actually write test cases, which is kind of interesting. Um, but with Eclipse, you get the method bodies. And you, get the method. You, get, you get a template that shows up, so you still have to actually design it. Though. Um, so some common setup can be replaced with a method called set setup, so it's run before each test. So there's some automation that's built into it, um, but uh, learning JUnit and using it, once you use it, it's been pretty consistent among all the different versions. And uh, you'll find that uh, you'll probably fall into a pattern of uh, using some of the automation, some of the manual ways. In fact, setup is kind of a great way to sort of um, add some automation to it. There's some other little tricks as well that's not mentioned in here as, as, as well. So setup can be used to uh, automatically uh, run it you know, set up the environment, the data, initialize everything before you're actually um, running the test. And then we have break teardown, uh, which is run at the end after the test. It's used for cleaning up the resources, such as files, networks, databases, stuff like that. So we create a teardown method. We create the method uh, to delete, I, you know, actually we don't have to delete anything, but here we have b is equal to null in this particular example. And in the setup example, we had uh, b is equal to new bank. So we create the objects in the setup. 
we tear the objects down and the tear down. It's a way of automating it with methods instead of manually just keeping putting stuff in there. Because we can reuse the tear ups and the and setups and the tear downs. So. I right, grouping tests with the at x test. Uh, so we can group tests together to make them logically uh, organized in terms of what it is we're testing. So some tests run faster than others. You can separate them out to small tests, medium tests, large tests. It depends on what you're testing, actually, in terms of what it's going to run. On an Android project, testing is not really that. Uh, the testing is not really that f slow. It's pretty fast because programmers are pretty fast. So. Um, so test driven, driven development, I'm actually going to go through all this because you guys aren't going to remember anything, but <laughs> going through this test driven software development methodology, there's a life cycle to it in terms of software development life cycle that is done in terms of the development process. Here's a kind of an example of the traditional test last, test driven comparison. So A is save everything to the last, so we code and then we test. In the item number B, we have test-driven development where we're testing while we're coding. So we're creating unit tests, and then we're coding, and then we're refactoring, and then we're creating, we're, we're testing at the end. So people, the proponents that love JUnit and love unit testing always say, well, you know, while you're writing the code, you can write the test methods, you can te excuse me, test cases. And it can sort of automate it to a certain point at the end, because when you get ready to test it at the end, all of those all of the code is written for you already. Um, so in a traditional versus a test-driven environment, there's a lot more unit testing that's done during the coding phase, long story short. Um, but this isn't a software development class. But if you were to turn Android development into a software development project, you probably want to integrate unit testing, and JUnit is the way you're going to do it. Uh, so test-driven development is design testing approach. involves short, rapid iterations of coding, testing, designing, and going over again. And, and you may have noticed in uh, Eclipse there's an option called refactoring. And factoring and refactoring, and that's basically just the terminology that's being used to rename certain things in the project. When you refactor, you, you rename the project name. Maybe you're also changing perhaps the package information or the directory location or anything about the project. So changing the structure of the code without changing its behavior is really what's referred to as refactoring. And you probably have seen that a couple of times. If not, if you've ever tried to change the name of anything in Android or actually even working with a Java class, it's the same terminology that's built into the menuing system of Eclipse. So examples of refactoring here are renaming, um, extracting methods, extracting interfaces, doing inline stuff, pushing uh, pulling up, popping down. So it's integrated uh, into Eclipse automatically. It automatically refactors for you. Um, in fact, if you make a change to the manifest and you put in, which some of you might actually try to do if you ever try to upload one of your apps into, um, upload it into the Android uh, Google Play, you might want to um, change the manifest to support all different Android versions. So you can specify a minimum or a maximum. Actually, I never specify a maximum. I always do a minimum level. Minimum level I usually set around 2.0, 2.2, 2 2.3. When it's happening, after you change anything associated with the configuration or the structure of the app, it's going to immediately pull up this refactoring screen if you haven't seen it yet and say, Would you like to refactor? Or would you like to update project properties? And you press OK. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it does really weird things. <laughs> so, don't be surprised if it does really weird things and you have to go through and change something. Maybe it created an R dot something file because it thought it was in a different path location and you refactored it and it had to resolve some of that information. It couldn't figure out where it was supposed to go. So, Or something else really weird happened. So, Long story short, same thing with JUnit and refactoring as a concept. Not always foolproof. <laughs> Mixed mistakes. Well, automation makes mistakes. The Eclipse automated tools make mistakes. Well, so do humans as well. Um, in terms of the test-driven development, I'm going to kind of, because it's getting kind of late, I'm going to kind of thumb through this stuff. But um, it's a short, you can download the slides and take a look at it. It's the last slide in the Android lectures. What you're doing is you're, the coding is driving the testing, and the testing is driving the coding. And so the programming and the testing are happening at the same stage of the development process. So they're more integrated. So you first develop a test, then you produce exactly 
uh, make sure it matches exactly what the code says. And if the test passed, great, uh, then you refactor or simplify or clarify or, or, you know, both, both the production code or the test code, depending upon where there was some, some inconsistency, if it didn't match. So you're basically going through iter iteratively going through and changing the code, changing the test, making, you know, uh, modifications. Because once you test it, then you figure out, oh, what's going on with this? Oh, it's producing this result. And in order to actually test efficiently, you almost have to write all the code first. <laughs> so once you write all the code and you get like half the test cases done, then you can sort of like finish up the test cases because you need the code to do some of the test cases that work with multiple classes, especially with intents and things like that. Um, so it's just kind of a cart before the egg or what is it, the chicken before the egg, and then it's like, it's the egg before the chicken. It's supposed to happen simultaneously, but you still have to write the code first, I think. So, Some different types of testing. This is not a testing class, but unit testing is only one type of testing, so you don't walk away thinking, oh, there's just J unit. That's all the testing I need, ever need to do. That's just one part of it. It's referred to as clear or white box because it's actually code testing. You're looking at what the code is actually doing. You're not testing the functionality. That's black box testing. When you load the app into the emulator and you run the program, in my particular case, and you see, oh, look, debug failure or, no, or whatever, uh, broken pipe and all this other stuff, that's black box testing. <laughs> I'm running the app and I'm seeing, oh, actually, this testing, the problem was with the emulator. But I might get an unexpected something or other that pops up on the screen that's app-related um, that might actually be in a different category of testing. There's integration and function testing, making sure the testing interactions and the test cases actually work. There's regression testing, stress load performance testing, acceptance testing. If you take a testing class, you'll get all of the different testing information. So, Some misconceptions, misperceptions, conceptions. There are many different mis nobody understands unit testing. Um, and they probably stem from the fact that the first word is test. Nobody, everyone hears the word test. It's kind of like debugging. You hear the word test, and they run run far from this concept because no one ever wants to test anything. And uh, TDD is not really about testing theoretically. It's about design, designing the code to be testable, <laughs> and figuring out fault failures and recovery while you're coding. So if you're writing the tests, running the tests while you're writing the code, you're understanding the code a little bit more. So you can fix logic errors, you can fix the code and improve the quality of the code. So automated tests are just nice side effect of the entire process. It's the thinking and the development process that's really um, part of TDD. Uh, let's see, functional testing. Formally, we have a couple of different tools out there, actually. Monkey does stress testing. In fact, I think uh, you can run Monkey from the ADB, ADB shell Monkey. You can actually go online and read about Monkey. I think I saved the link, actually. Here's some before I leave, though. There's some other, at the end of this lecture, there's some other resources. This may have changed because uh, the examples that are in this lecture come from the older Android website that recently changed over the weekend. So these links may have changed as well. But there's a tutorial, a blog, a bunch of documentation on the concept as well. I believe I saved the monkey link in here. And I believe it's the same link that was on there before. Uh, exercise monkey. So you can read through and hear about the exercise in my case. It's nothing more. You remember that IKEA commercial where they stick the chair under the, uh, I guess we're not, and the, this robot thing picks up the back of the chair, puts the chair down, picks it up, you know, they have to, the guy sits up, sits down, sits up like a thousand times or a million, does it for a couple of days. It's kind of like the test, the monkey. Give me your app, see how long it will run before it fails, you know. And then you'll notice, well, is it causing a memory leak? Is it, is there a, um, something about um, the database that's not working effectively. And so it's just a way of going through, and it's kind of like unit testing in a lot of ways, where unit testing is exercising your classes. Monkey's testing everything as a whole, and it's more of a, it's still a kind of a cross between white box and black box, but it's, it's definitely uh, running automatically, so it's another form of automatic test testing, uh, but it's basically aimed at testing the entire so. so Monkey is a program that runs in your emulator or your device, generates 
random, su uh, random streams of user events, such as clicks, touches, and gestures. So, hard to tell exactly what it's doing. It's all automated. <laughs> but it will run in your emulator. And if you are curious, uh, you can run it from a command prompt, actually. Uh, you can probably do it from the new ADB manager, actually, but I'm not sure if the option. They used to have menu options for it, and they've disappeared. So, And if you're looking for the link, it is on the Android development site, and it's developer.android.com. Tools help monkey that HTML. So. That concludes all of the lectures and information I was supposed to give you for this class. A little bit out of order, but I finished, which is great. Uh, it's tough to get everything in in eight weeks' time, I'll tell you that. So the exam is on Monday, and you guys are in the later, so you can show up at five. If you're not in the Java class, you're not in the object-oriented programming class for Java, and you're just in the Android class, and you want to take the Android class at five o'clock, that's possible. Instead of waiting till like six thirty, seven, you can take any time from five o'clock till eight thirty. You can take any of the exams around. Well, what time is it now? Eight fifteen. Around this time tomorrow, or this time next one Monday, I'm going to probably want to take off. If you show up at nine o'clock at night, I don't think I'm going to be here. <laughs> But if you show up at 5 o'clock, I'll definitely be here. Or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Because there's a cross between this class and the previous one. A lot of you guys are taking both exams. Maybe if you're taking both exams, you can do them back to back. You can take one, take a break, come back, take the other one. I'm a little bit flexible. I'm not starting them until 5 o'clock, though. Because I know I have had people emailing me already asking me, when are the exams starting? Hey, 5 o'clock. <laughs> so let me stop this video. So.